this week for our, our weekly huddle. The medical huddle is facilitated by the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation as a way to share current information regarding the hospital's COVID-19 response. If you've logged into WebEx, please join the chat by emailing your questions or comments. And if you've called in, we want to ask you to please send your question via email to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We want to remind you to mute your phones so we can limit the background noise. We'll be answering as many questions as possible after we hear from our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jeff DeLisi. So Dr. DeLisi, I'd like to go ahead and get started. And, um, you know, when I enter the hospital every day, the first thing I see is our excellent nursing team because they make sure that I've got my mask on and they check my body temperature. And then they certainly make sure before I come in that I sanitize my hands. All best practices to make sure that everybody stands safe. Um, the second thing that I see is this poster that talks about uh, a number of COVID patients that have been treated and recovered. So um, my first question is, can you tell us how we're doing this week as far as recoveries? Yeah, so um, it's, been a, it's been a busy week here at Virginia Hospital Center. We actually, um, you know, over last weekend, we saw a dip in our numbers, and we've actually seen, them, seen that number come back up a little bit over the course of the last week. So we have uh, some more patients here than we did last week. Overall, we've discharged over 170 patients uh, with COVID since this whole sort of ordeal started. Um, we've had three patients extubated that uh, we've been able to discharge as well. So, um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of patients, but we've been able to get a lot of patients safely out of the hospital, which has been really great and rewarding. And um, we're just so fortunate to have such a great team here to be working together on this, uh, on this endeavor. Well, thank you. I, I like to focus on the positivity um, at the end of the day. That's what it's all about. And to that point, you know, one of the things that um, we talked about last week was the importance of wearing a mask. But, you know, social distancing, we're kind of taking it for granted. And a lot of people do practice social distancing. But it seems like, you know, as the longer this is going on, some people um, either they're just tired of it or they think it's safe. Why is it so important for us to continue to socially distance? Yeah, I mean, we don't want this to spread. Um, you know, what we've seen at Virginia Hospital Center has been very consistent with what we have seen uh, across the country. So a couple numbers to throw out to all of you today. Um, within the last week, we have been able to start screening patients that come to our hospital. So in other words, anybody who gets admitted into our hospital is getting a rapid COVID test, and we find out right away whether they have it or not. And what we've seen is in, in patients that don't have any symptoms of COVID, um, and we test them, it's about 2 to 3% have COVID. So we know it's out there in the community. 2 or 3% of Arlington probably has COVID. And so it's so important for us to continue to, to socially distance, um, when people come to the hospital, wear a mask, use proper hand hygiene. If we can do that, we know we can keep, keep that rate low like it is. If we stop doing that, we're all afraid that it's, it's, it's going to go up. It's, it's kind of amazing to think about how busy our hospital has been over the last month, just in our inpatient floors and taking care of these COVID patients, and only 2 or 3% of our population has it. So can you imagine how much it would overwhelm our health system if 10 or 15% had it? In fact, that's what you've seen on the news in New York. Uh, in fact, there's some reports coming out that you know, 15 to 20% of the population has COVID. And you saw from all those news stories that it overwhelmed the healthcare system. So it's so important for us to, to, to respect those social distancing recommendations and to keep doing that so we can keep that rate of infection as low as possible while we're working, while we're waiting for so many brave people in this country and around the world that are working so hard to get us a vaccine or a definitive treatment for this, this horrible virus. Thank you, Dr. Lisi. Um, part of the challenge with social distancing is, you know, many people uh, find themselves spending a lot of time alone. And so while they're practicing, you know, safety from that perspective, um, can you speak to the importance of staying connected uh, especially as it relates to mental health and wellness. 
it, it's so important. And I can, I can tell you even at my own home, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I have been trying to make sure that our kids have video play dates with their friends because it's so important. We're all used to being a, a very social society and going out with friends, um, seeing our family. And it's, it's really tough. Um, you know, it's, it's tough on all of us. It's tough. Uh, my son's birthday was last weekend and, you know, the grandparents came and they had to stay six feet away from us in the driveway. Uh, while they're wishing him a happy birthday and i think that was tough on him and and certainly tough on them and tough on my wife and and it's it's tough but um you know i can say that at least we live in a world now where we can have this kind of video interaction like we're having today and everybody has phones and ipads and you can see people um even if you just stay stay home and stay isolated and i certainly recommend that you you take advantage of the technology that we do have today that we didn't have, you know, even 10, 20 years ago. Um, I think it makes this a lot easier than it would have been uh, at that time if we didn't have that ability to be able to connect via video. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I uh, noticed the governor's had a busy week. A lot of people think because of the daily briefing coming out of Washington that that's where all the decisions are made. But in fact, we're part of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the governor has a lot of influence with the health uh, healthcare commissioner, and um, you know, one of the one of the questions that came into me since last week it was affected by the governor's decision. The question that I that that came into me last week, Dr. Delisi, was um, there's a patient, and she had a procedure here at Virginia Hospital Center, and it was canceled due to the governor's um, decree. Now it's been over four weeks, and she's getting very concerned, and. So she's concerned about jeopardizing her own long-term health by putting up this procedure. What can you tell our patients about that are in that similar situation? So, so a couple of things. First off, you know, we're certainly very respectful of the governor's order. And, and um, you know, when he put it out there just over a month ago now, um, it was still a time of great uncertainty. Um, how much would this ramp up? What would hospitals' experiences with this be? How much PPE were we going to be able to get to protect ourselves, our staff, our patients? It's a month later, though, now. And, you know, as you said, Tony, there's a lot of people who had surgeries put off, and they need them now. Um, the uh, math on it was a little bit um, different. So one of the things we always do as physicians is you have to weigh the risk and benefit of a situation. So four weeks ago, the risk benefit might have said, well, you know, if I wait four weeks, there's not huge risk to you. And the benefit is I'm not bringing you into the hospital and there's COVID and we're starting figuring everything out. We might lose PPE. Maybe we won't have enough PPE to do as many cases as we, we think. So um, the benefit of waiting outweighs, uh, you know, outweighs the risk of, of doing it right away. You go, you go forward in time here and now today you've waited for four weeks and maybe, you know, you still have a cancer that needs to be treated. Or uh, I heard some of our GI doctors talking about patients who, um, had a positive Cologuard test. Cologuard is the at-home um, stool sample test where you find out if you have DNA or blood or something in your stool that might make you more risk for cancer. Well, if you have that positive test, maybe you can wait a couple weeks before you get your colonoscopy, but boy, you really got to get that because uh, you got to find out if there's something that, that can be treated um, quickly, surgically, um, that'll cure you potentially of the, of the cancer. So we think that the, the, the equation has changed. Um, we are certainly open to do procedures that are in line with the governor's order. So um, the governor, I think, really did a nice job of giving um, practitioners the ability to safely take care of their patients. So you can do procedures on, obviously, if it's an urgent or emergent case, but you can also do procedures for patients whose condition is going to get worse if you delay the case. So we're looking at some of those cases right now and the surgeons have started scheduling some of those cases where again, they're, they're afraid the patient's condition is going to worsen if they don't get, get the case moving. On top of that, what I'm really excited, I think I may have mentioned it last week on this call, but um, again, we've, we've ramped it up this week. Anybody who has a procedure at Virginia hospital center, whether that's a surgery, whether that's a cardiac catheterization procedure, whether that's an interventional radiology procedure, a bronchoscopy, or an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, or an EGD, which is a, a, the upper endoscopy, we're going to do a rapid test on those patients in their preoperative holding area on the day of the procedure. 
on that day. Now, different places are doing different things. We're certainly, we feel really, um, we're, we're excited that we have the capability to test all of those patients. Um, we think it's the safest thing for patients and the safest thing for our staff because what that COVID test tells you is does somebody have COVID on that day? So for instance, if there was another place that might say, well, we're going to test the COVID on you two days before you have the procedure and then tell you to stay at home and, and self-isolate. Well, that means you didn't have COVID two days ago. It doesn't mean you have it on the day of the procedure. Um, it only is, is that snapshot in time two days ago. So doing that test on the day of the procedure, we think is really important to keeping patients safe and keeping our staff safe. Um, some, some have asked questions about news articles they've seen and, and whether the test is safe or not, or whether the test is false negatives. Is the test 100% accurate? The test isn't 100% accurate, no test is, but we know from the 2% that we think have it in our community that if you come in and you don't have any symptoms of COVID and you test negative, that it's 99.7% certain that you don't actually have COVID. And we think that gives us a lot of confidence to safely do that procedure. Of course, you don't want to get a pr big procedure and then find out the next day that you have COVID or that your, your body's trying to fight COVID at the same time. So we're really excited to be able to offer that to our patients. In addition, we've gotten some really good data and the number of our staff that have been uh, infected or sick has been extraordinarily low. Uh, we've had a very minimal number of, of our staff that have been infected. And in fact, we've had no instances of staff to patient um, infections. So we know it's safe. All of our staff are wearing gowns and gloves and masks all the time. Um, you know, the, I like to say it's safer to come here than to come to Whole Foods. <laughs> and so we think we can safely take care of patients, get those procedures done um, so people are healthy, which is, which is why we're here, to keep our community healthy. Thank you, Dr. Delisi. Um, these next couple of questions that are coming in relate to some of the things you've already addressed but kind of drill down a little bit um, around tests. Um, does, the, do, does the Commonwealth have enough tests um, to meet the need um, as, as people, are, the symptomatic patients are presenting? Yeah, the, the testing has gotten a lot better. There is, uh, there is enough testing, I think, uh, certainly here in Northern Virginia. I, don't, I can't necessarily speak for the entire Commonwealth, but um, there is enough testing here. I mean, we, we have um, the ability to run a bunch of tests in-house every day. Even if we need to send out tests, um, the turnaround time has come way down. It was, it was as high as four to seven days, uh, even just a few weeks ago, and now that's down to one or two days. So I think the commercial labs have really ramped up their ability to do the testing. Uh, and so we feel good about where we're at with the testing uh, capabilities right now. And the drive through um, center on Quincy Street here in Arlington, that's still um, taking um, patients. 100%, yeah. yeah. We've done up to 110 in a day. We've done over 1,000 patients now in that drive through So uh, we're really proud of that, and we're going we're gonna to keep it going. Um, we have a question about the emergency room. You know, this goes back to people um, getting a procedure done that's maybe urgent or emergent, but if somebody – has a situation where they need emergency medicine. Yep. What do we tell them? Is it safe to come to emergency room yeah. at Virginia Hospital Center? It's, it is safe to come to the emergency room at Virginia Hospital Center. So again, what is our staff wearing? Well, our, all of our emergency room staff, every person in this hospital is wearing a mask. And any patient or visitor that comes into our hospital is also gonna be wearing a mask. And per CDC guidelines, if both people are wearing masks, the risks of exposure are extraordinarily low. And it also, our staff is going to be using, um, you know, all the best practices, infection prevention, changing gloves, washing their hands all the time. Um, you know, I, again, I, I like to use the Whole Foods example, and, and maybe I'll give you a quick example of that. I think of the difference. I mean, obviously, healthcare is different than going to the supermarket. But, you know, people are worried. They're coming here. Is there COVID here? How am I going to be safe? Well, we get you right in the room. we got staff, again, that's wearing wearing gloves, wearing masks, washing their hands every time they come in and out of a room. You know, I was in Whole Foods on, on Sunday night. It's, it's, uh, in fact, my wife gets more concerned about me going to Whole Foods than coming to work every day. And, uh, you know, when I was checking out, I noticed, I thought it was great. They'd put up these glass, um, uh, sort of plexiglass uh, dividers between you and the cashier. And the cashier was wearing a mask and the cashier was wearing gloves. But I saw the cashier wearing gloves 
um, as they were doing the, the person that was checking out in front of me. So in other words, whatever the, I don't know whether the person in front of me was wearing gloves as they were going through the supermarket or not, but everything that that person touched was on the conveyor belt. And then the, the checkout person's not changing their gloves. It's good they're wearing gloves for themselves, but that means all of my groceries were touched by whatever was on the person beforehand. So um, we're, we're not doing that here, right? Obviously we're changing gloves. We're washing hands between every patient. Um, so we think, uh, we think the chances of exposure at, at the hospital is actually very, very low. Uh, another question that's come in is that, um, you know, we've talked about this every week uh, and, and it obviously drives things like the emergent um, and urgent uh, procedure thing. Uh, it's all around supplies. I mean, that's really the challenge is PPE and supply. And so um, there's still a lot of, media coverage about the lack of supplies. Um, you know, please uh, tell, tell our um, participants about our situation with supplies here. So, uh, you know, we, we meet twice a day. We meet at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. by conference call. All of our kind of leadership, executive leadership, I run the calls. Um, and one of the things that we go over every day is our supplies. We actually have a supply forecast um, uh, workbook that we look at and we look at how much of it we used yesterday. If we keep using it that rate, would we run out ever? Uh, and our supply team under, you know, probably a lot of you met Charles Fletcher. He's done just a tremendous job um, during this crisis and his team have been, I mean, they worked around the clock to find supplies in various different places and get them here. Um, so uh, we feel good about where we're at. And we're also starting to see signs too, that the supply chain is now starting to catch up with the demand. Um, you know, it, it takes a couple weeks for, I think, everything to ramp up, but we're starting to see the fruits of that ramp up now. Uh, and I think we're getting access to some more PPE, which is, which is great, especially as we ramp up our outpatient areas. So that's what we're focused on now is as we ramp up our outpatient areas, what additional, um, what additional levels of PPE are we going to need? Uh, and we want to make sure that we have those. Yep. Um, we've got people conditioned because of the media. People want to know how many people are in the hospital that have tested positive for COVID or presumed positive? Today, it's 90. 90 people yep. today. 90. And we're going to see that number probably go up because of the testing, right? We're just um, testing more people. We are testing more people. You know, we, we really actually thought it was going to, we were hoping it was going to go down um, during the course of this week. It did not. It went up. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it's, it's anybody's guess. We, we are seeing, you know, there, there's a sort of a phenomenon that we've, we've always, uh, sort of seen at hospitals where, um, you know, our ERs are, are slower on weekends, right? Especially nice weekends in the spring when people can go outside, um, people don't come into our ER. And so the hospital doesn't fill up. And we thought for sure, you know, we would not see that phenomenon with COVID because if you're sick with COVID, people will come to the emergency room. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. Nobody came in last weekend and then we got, we were, uh, we, had, we had a lot of admissions on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, as the weekend ended. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We, it certainly could go up. Um, we're certainly concerned about what's going to happen as the state opens up again. Um, you know, certainly we need the economy to, to get going again. But, you know, again, going back to the questions about social distancing, I think it's going to remain important. We don't want to see more than 2% of our population infected with this. Well, and that kind of leads right into the next question. We have a question here about, you know, so many people are, uh, it's presumed that they're asymptomatic. Yeah. And so if you take in the number of people that are asymptomatic, asymptomatic, you know, what is your sense of how many people are walking around with COVID, don't know it? Um, the two to three percent. That's what we think the number is. Because that, that, that two to three percent is a number based on, um, you know, new moms coming in. We're, we're, we are testing anybody up in our labor and delivery unit. Uh, and other people that got admitted for non-COVID reasons, just testing them. So that's that's where, where we're getting that number from. So um, it's interesting how people are getting more educated about um, how they monitor their own health and condition. And so one of the questions was, you know, should people have um, home um, oximeters to to measure to, to measure their own oxygen levels in their blood, being that this is a, a condition that affects that? Um, you know, I I think there are home home. Technology that's out there for people to take care of themselves at home and get information on themselves is, is amazing. So I, I don't think I would ever advocate against having a pulse oximeter at home. 
Um, but I'm not sure what that adds, you know, one way or another to the to the diagnosis. If you have symptoms, you should call your doctor. You should probably get tested, uh, and then we can make recommendations from there. I will say, you know, one of the things that we've found on our inpatients here, um, one of the things that's been most important in the treatment of them is having them lay prone, having them lay on their belly. Uh, and for reasons that's, you know, sort of still unclear, it apparently has, has, uh, has had a huge benefit for patients. We've been able to intubate less patients by getting people to lay on their belly uh, up to 16 hours a day if, if they can. So, um, you know, I, for anybody out there that, that may get it or, or whatnot, um, Lay on your belly. <laughs> oh, that's good advice. Um, time for just a couple more questions. One question was around uh, going back to patients that uh, maybe they they had all the symptoms of COVID, but they never were tested because maybe there wasn't yeah. access to tests at the beginning. But now they're hearing about the benefits of donating plasma if you've recovered from COVID. So is there a way for um, folks that have recovered from some serious upper respiratory infection not confirmed it's COVID, that they can go find out if they have the antibodies and then be helpful yeah. with the plasma donation. So if you, if you were not, so there, I guess there's two tracks. You can, um, if you were diagnosed with COVID and you want to uh, donate plasma, you have to have a negative rapid test or a, or a negative COVID antigen test. So another one of those nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swabs uh, that is a negative test that happens at least 14 days after symptoms. So you would have to have that test, and then you would have to have an antibody test to see if you have the antibodies. Uh, and then you, we could get you through the American Red Cross to donate. If you had an upper respiratory symptom and you're, uh, you think you may have had COVID, um, you have to have a COVID test first to make sure that you're negative, again, at least 14 days after the symptoms. Uh, and then as well, you need to have a, uh, an antibody test to see if you have the antibodies. Um, so we can do either one of them. If you can get, if you're interested in it and you think you had it, um, you know, feel free to reach out to the foundation team and they can get you in contact with Dr. Cora Padich, who's our uh, medical director of the lab, and, and she can help facilitate that. Okay, thank you. Well, here's a question for me. I think oh, I can sure. handle this one. It's a non clinical <laughs> question, Dr. Delisi. It, it, it sounds like from, you know, reading, um, uh, reading online that um, the hospital has, uh, has plenty of food donors and that you said they have plenty of supplies. So how else can we help? So I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the reality is, is that with the downturn in the, the number of patients that we're able to treat and with the, with, with the up uh, tick in the un, unbudgeted expenses related to PPE and other expenses in, in, in treating our COVID patients, you know, the hospital does need financial resources, no question about it. And we have established a, a special fund, the COVID-19 Mitigation Response Fund for Virginia Hospital Center. Um, you could get all the information on our website, and that's at www.vhcfoundation.com forward slash COVID-19. And um, to date, I wanna thank all the folks in the community that have donated to that fund. Dr. Delisi, we've raised over $600,000 in cash. Thank you. Um, another another $50,000 in donated PPE, and thousands of meals have been donated, uh, keeping our frontline people well-fed. So um, if you would consider going online, checking it out, making a gift, that would be great. So um, we're just about, our time's just about up. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating this week. I want to especially thank Dr. Delisi. The man's working around the clock, and he's always making time for us. So thank you, sir. Thanks for and to me. everybody who's joined us today, stay safe, stay healthy, and goodbye. Thank you. All right. Great.